Hello and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. I'm Liz Kay. This summer, Providence College's Office of Institutional Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion is working with other campus partners to present the second annual summer series on racial equity and justice. These weekly webinars highlight the lived experiences of marginalized members of our community and the ways that the pandemic has further displaced vulnerable people and groups. For recordings of past webinars and to register for future talks, go to institutionaldiversity.providence.edu. In the third presentation in the series, Dr. Alex Orquiza of the Department of History and Classics and students from the Asian American Association discussed what Asian American means here and now, considering four centuries of Asian Amer immigration to the Americas and how those stories affect us today. Thank you for inviting us uh, to, to share our, our experiences as Asian Americans. Uh, there's a couple of us that uh, are, are giving this presentation together, uh, specifically the executive board of PC Asian Am, uh, Tina Nguyen, Alicia Singharaj, Josh Dator, and Aiden Kastri Uh We are uh, here to speak with you about what it means to be Asian American here and now uh, in this unique moment in American history. And with that, let's get the slides going here. Let's see. Do, do. What does it mean to be Asian American here and now? Well, maybe it's because I'm an historian, but I like to think first about origins. What does the term Asian American or Asian American Pacific Islander even mean? None of us are born Asian American, just as people aren't born European American or any other ethnic or national identity. The term had to emerge from somewhere. And as an historian, uh, I'll assert that the past is incredibly informative in trying to understand what that definition means. That's because Asians have been in America before there was even a United States. It's been, we have been here for as long as the United States has been a nation. You can easily make the case that the Asian American experience in America is central to the national story, particularly in stories of race, immigration, and citizenship. You go all the way back to 1763, and this is when Filipinos settled in Louisiana, what is now New Orleans, uh, in the 18th century as part of the Spanish galleon trade between Manila and Acapulco, with stops along the way in places like New Orleans and Baja, California. You could go back to the 1790s, when there were South Asians in what is now Oregon and Washington. Uh, and they were there because of British colonialism and the proximity to British Columbia, Vancouver, and uh, the British Empire's re uh, reliance on coolie labor uh, from South Asia. You could go back to uh, the 1790s. Uh, you guys, I'm not sure if this is advancing. There we go. So, uh, you could go back to the 1830s. Uh, before Hawaii was even an American state, there were British sugar barons who were hiring Chinese agricultural laborers and contract laborers. Uh, that were setting up businesses for import and export between New York and Boston. You head up to the North Shore here to Peabody and the Peabody Essex Museum, you'll see evidence of the long established connections between New England and East Asia. Where I'm from in California, you go back to 1848 and the discovery of gold in California and the use of Chinese laborers to construct the, the mines and the railroads that ultimately built the American West and the Continental Railroad. At the same time, you have the arrival of the very first Japanese immigrants coming into the United States in 1869 in a place called Placerville, uh, where they are setting up the Wakamatsu tea and silk colony uh, and settling down into uh, the first large Japanese American communities in the United States. You have a big switch right after World War II, the same way that the United States economy and the United States population is changing with the baby boomers after World War II. You have an influx of Asian immigrants coming in from the Immigration Act of 1965. And you have a large number of doctors, lawyers, engineers, and nurses, and nurses all arriving at high numbers from Asia uh, and changing the dynamic of who is Asian and Asian American in the United States as more and more high-skilled, white-collar, high-skilled workers are coming into the country. In 1975, thanks to a war that was caused by the United States, you have an influx of refugees coming in from the Vietnam War, from Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. They're all seeking new lives in the United States, but they're seeking new lives as a result of the actions of American foreign policy. So immigration is tied directly to American domestic and foreign policy. And these stories to keep on going on because 
you literally could have a lecture just on all the different Asian American experiences here in the United States because Asia comprises over 50 nations. And uh, statistically speaking, in terms of population, 59.51% of the world's population, right? Like it's a huge group. It's a large number. And if you're trying to distill it down, this is probably what you can get from the last US census in 2020. Every state in the union has experienced the growth in AAPI populations. Every state plus Washington, DC. There are currently over 18.9 million AEPIs in the United States, and that population is expected to triple by 2060. And it actually builds onto a, a population growth that is incredibly phenomenal because of this. Asian Americans were the nation's largest and fastest growing racial or ethnic group over the last 20 years, surpassing Hispanic Americans and HPI, that's Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, Black and White. So this group is only gonna to continue to grow. And some of the largest growth rates for Asian American communities are coming from places that are non-traditional, uh, places where Asian, American, it, it, Asian Americans in the past haven't contributed to the largest numbers of growth. Uh, place, uh, immigrants from India, immigrants from Pakistan, immigrants from Thailand, uh, Nepalese, Burmese, Bhutanese, multiple different things, multiple different communities, multiple different national identities. So how do you unite such a diverse collection of people for political power? It's a tough question that we're gonna unpack over the course of this talk. But before we get into unpacking that, I wanted to share the, share the, uh, the, uh, 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 the experiences of uh, some of our Asian American panelists from this group, specifically the PC Asian American uh, Executive Board. So what we're gonna share are some personal perspectives on the Asian American experience. Uh, who would like to go first? Um, Please introduce yourselves. Mm -hmm. um, hello, I am Alicia Singharat. Oops, sorry. Still trying to figure out Zoom. Um, and I am the vice president of Asian AM. So with, uh, with Dr. Arkiza talking about how all these, how the influx of Asian Ameri Asians are coming into um, America and that's supposed to triple that that information I knew I, I knew about this and I still like get surprised at how much like how many people are actually coming in um, and as a child of immigrants myself I actually relate really well to like the refugees um, coming in from Laos uh, my parents were actually refugees um, during the whole war the Vietnam War but I didn't learn about any of that until very recently so I try not to pry into my parents' life unless they tell me about it. And I recently only learned that they were like, it was tough back then. Like they were separated when they were younger. My dad had like four sisters and they were all separated at like during their teenage years. And I think that heavily influenced like my life now as how they want to give me a childhood where that they couldn't have and also give me like goals and motivations and whatnot for me to also have that they couldn't have a chance to build for themselves because of all the war going on. They were too busy trying to immigrate from their like war, like the war going on from home, immigrating over here and actually finding just work, any work possible. They didn't have the time to, you know, apply for school like I do. So they tried giving me those opportunities as immigrant parents. So I think having to hear about like so many people trying to come into the US from Asia is like, it's pretty wild to me. I could contribute to this as well. Uh, my parents are part of that immigrant wave that comes in from the 1965 Immigration Act. And uh, when they immigrated from the Philippines, they were told that there's basically two ways to get to the United States. Either you become a lawyer or you become a doctor. So my parents are both medical doctors. They immigrated as part of that wave that's recruiting uh, medical professionals. And when I was growing up, uh, they didn't realize that I didn't also have to be a doctor. So <laughs> I have two older sisters uh, and myself, all three of us were told when we were kids that you're gonna be doctors like us. And then they realized, wait, we're in the United States, we don't have to be doctors. Uh, but when you're, when you're coming from one of these Asian countries that, that's, that's uh, uh, targeted as, as a high skilled worker, like your, your options for when you're uh, in your teens and 20s are incredibly limited in comparison to being in the United States.
Oh, I was going to add on to that again, because I just forgot something that I was supposed to mention. Um, I didn't realize how hard it is to actually immigrate here to the U.S. My parents, like, you couldn't just fly over with a couple papers. Like, you had to have a sponsor to bring you over to the U.S. And even with a sponsor, you have, like, they won't even bring your family half the time. Like, my aunts and uncles, they had a hard time bringing each other over to the U.S. without having, like, a really strong sponsor to bring them over. So with Dr. Akiza, like, having to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatnot, having a really high, like, a very looked up upon pres um profession at the time my family couldn't do that because obviously they're like they're way too young to be doing um applying for jobs uh of that high education so sponsors were really important during that time and even if you did have the high skills that allowed you to come over uh as part of the 1965 immigration act uh, once you arrived in the united states you were thrown into a job competition with native born americans and in the 1960s and 1970s as there is today vast amounts of racism. So there are a lot of Southeast Asian uh, doctors and lawyers and engineers that are not practicing medicine or the law because of uh, those kinds of institutional uh, barriers. Okay, we'll continue uh, with a couple more uh, bits on how to answer that question, just what does Asian American even mean? Well, uh, historically, Asian American emerges as a term in the 1960s. Uh, it's coined in the heady times of the African American, Latino American, and Native American civil rights movements. And Asian American is basically an umbrella term, uh, but one that made sense in the heat of the civil rights movement because from the very beginning, this was a pan ethnic alliance. It was a group that depended on alliances beyond the Asian American community. Uh, protests in California specifically grew up in a, in a movement called the Third World Liberation Front a name that's not politically correct today, but encompasses all of the so-called black, brown, and yellow countries of the world and the reassertions of their significance in an increasingly multi-ethnic, multicultural, and non-white America that's emerging in the 1960s. So these protests for the Third World Liberation Front begin in places like San Francisco State University and UC Berkeley. Here's an image uh, from UC Berkeley, Bancroft Way, for those of you that know Cal. Uh, that shows uh, this multi-ethnic solidarity. You see faces from multiple different ethnic groups that are represented in this protest in 1968. Across the Bay in San Francisco, you see that the Third World Liberation Front is protesting the, the curriculum of San Francisco State at this heady time of the anti-war movement. Take a look at that uh, protest sign, AFROTC off campus, that means get military training off of campus in 1968 in the context of the Vietnam War. They weren't just asking for the removal and the, uh, the stop of, of American actions in Vietnam, however. They're also talking about a wholesale reconsideration of how a university works. Uh, there's movements for sit-ins in classrooms and administrative buildings. Uh, they're trying to force university leadership at Cal and at San Francisco State to consider issues of inclusivity in the curriculum and in campus life. In other words, it's a precedent for a lot of the academic debates that go on today and that we've been seeing for the last 60 years. Asian Americans or the Asian American identity uh, as a term emerges from two UC Berkeley undergraduates, Yuji Ichioka and Emma G. And they 30 years later have this to say about why they turned uh, Asian American. There were so many Asians out there in the political demonstrations, but we had no effectiveness. Everyone was lost in the larger rally. We figured that if we rallied behind our own banner, behind an Asian American banner, we'd have an effect on the larger public. And this is, uh, again, uh, the two undergraduates now 30 years later, Yuji Ichioka and Emma G, who, caused, uh, who coined uh, the term Asian American. Do uh, you guys have any questions so far? I'm going to look on the module here to see if there are any questions or any hands raised. Nothing yet. Okay, let's proceed. Is the term Asian American today uh, or Asian American Pacific Islander politically or culturally useful today? Uh, how do these historical narratives of Asian American immigration or Asians coming to the United States affect our lives today? Well, is it useful? First thing is that, as we alluded to earlier, 
homogenizing such a large population really does a disservice to all the different intricacies that, uh, that are part of an individual experience. Uh, uh, Alicia and I have completely different experiences, despite the fact that we're both Asian American, right? Like, I know it sounds simple, but it's incredibly detailed and important to understand because of the disparities between different Asian American groups. Homogenizing the Asian American experience clearly overlooks disparities in individual experiences. Take a look at this uh, graph for uh, access to affordable uh, to health insurance before the ACA. When you take a look at this very closely, the, uh, the average for Asian Americans is 12.5%. But Tongan, Korean, Pakistani, Thai, Bangladesh, and Cambodian, Vietnamese all have a harder time at the time of uh, finding uh, health insurance than uh, Asian American groups with longer uh, uh, historical connections to the United States. Oh, oh what happened there? Uh, Basically, like when, when you take a look at the, the access to healthcare, you, you get a microcosm of the different kinds of Asian American experiences that are going on for different groups. Another way of looking at this is the uh, proficiency, proficiency in English. Uh, Vietnamese, Korean, Cambodian, Chinese, Hmong all have different uh, and, uh, and lower levels of English proficiency than uh, Native Hawaiian, uh, Indian, and Japanese, which has direct effects and knock-on effects on things like higher education, access to higher education, earning, and quality of life. Arguably the most dangerous way uh, that the Asian American identity of the 1960s in that term has affected the Asian American community is in the stereotype of the model minority. Uh, it's arguably the most dangerous and homogenizing uh, effect that this has had. American popular culture at the time that this model minority myth that Asian Americans were the best minorities, that they were the model minority for others to follow, uh, was created as a wedge between minority groups, specifically to differentiate between so-called good and bad minorities and prop up this belief in the American dream and that certain people, if you stay in your lane, will have a higher access to it. Asian Americans become the model minorities and as a result, and at the expense of other ethnic groups in the United States. How does this affect us today? Well. If you're trying to be perfect and you're trying to be an Asian American model minority, chances are you're not gonna speak out about the pressures that come with always having to be perfect. So living up to the model minority stereotype means silently suffering or having to be perfect in the eyes of society and family and cultural pressures. And that takes a toll, especially because Asian Americans are three times less likely to seek mental health services than other Americans. It's culturally taboo to talk about these things in many Asian cultures. So there are many Asian Americans that are silently suffering. When I was speaking with uh, the PC Asian Am board today, I was like, the, the, the duck metaphor works perfectly here, that you're presenting a face above water where everything is calm and still, but underneath you're struggling the whole time just to maintain that appearance. It's very, very common within the Asian American community to, to suffer this way and to not speak about it and seek mental health and work with mental health uh, uh, professionals. Comparatively speaking, Asian Americans are far less likely to seek therapy to discuss their mental health and end up silently suffering. So this is uh, our percentages here. 18.1% of Asian Americans have uh, solved health services or health services in uh, when this was published in 2012, which is a vast difference to the 46.3% of white Americans. That number has only gotten even more disproportionate uh, since COVID and the uh, anti-Asian anti -Asian racism that's happened in the last uh, year and a half. I'm gonna kick it again to our students who have bravely uh, volunteered to talk about some of their personal perspectives on Asian American mental health. Um, I could start off again on this one. Um, I thought it was really interesting how Dr. Urquiza connects the model minority myth to how, why Asian Americans have so like have such a hard time reaching out for mental health struggles. Um, growing up, I definitely felt that kind of pressure where I had to be like a perfect student, a perfect daughter, especially as the oldest daughter of the house. I had to set uh, expectations and a standard for my younger siblings to follow, and. It, at some point I was like, wow, like I almost lost myself in it and I didn't reach out to anyone or tell anyone about it because I felt like, no, I have to 
I have to be perfect. I have to be able to do this without anyone's help. And that made it really hard when growing up because I started realizing like, oh, like I actually don't need to be perfect. I just need to do the best that I can do. And going into college, when I was struggling freshman year, I was like, no, 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 I can't get any help. I can't be asking for help because, you know, like if I can't do it now by myself, I can't do it later. But like, it was that kind of mindset. And I was like, wow, like this must be because of how I grew up and how my parents treated like maybe it was my own pressures as well, but I do think that it is also an older generation mindset that we immigrated here. We started from nothing and now we have things and we're getting you guys to college. Like we're, we, we have to have like more and more and more, we have to be better and better. And I realize I'm like, okay, like I'm struggling out here and I, I still have to be better and better. And it was just like a lot of pressure, especially going into college. And then after that, I realized I'm like, after, you know, hearing more experiences from other Asian Americans or anyone, really, I realized that I can ask for help. It's fine, like, to ask for help or seek out anyone for advice and whatnot. Like, I'm more open to it now because I realize that I don't need to be this, like, part of the model minority, but I don't have to be perfect in every single thing I do. So I think it heavily influences how we think now, because um, it definitely did for me. <laughs> I can go. I'm Tina. Um, I definitely agree with Alicia, but I still feel like I still struggle with it in a sense, just because even if I don't do something well in school, like get a good grade, I beat myself up for it and I just like get hella sad about it. And then um, just certain things like like my career path, like sometimes I just choose it just because it will make my parents happy. Like I know definitely the path that I'm on right now is not something I really want but if it's for the sake of my parents I'll still do it but I don't know I still can't get myself to really open up be like I can't I don't want to do this not it's not gonna make me happy because I feel like I'm just disappointing them because like they did struggle and they're still struggling a lot but and then I, I'm like the middle child my brother he's in the, like a pretty good path right now and I still have to feel like I have to live up to that but I don't know. I even like asking for help and I like, just talking to them about it. It's just really something I would rather not do just because I know, I know it's not their fault either, but it's just, I know they just won't understand me, you know? The cultural pressures and the expectations too are totally different too, coming from an Asian culture versus an American culture. Uh, I'm the youngest and the, uh, the only son of two older sisters. And my my eldest sister my eldest sister always just likes to say like well I'm the oldest so like I I had to make it harder for all of you uh, or like I had it harder than all of you and I'm like wait but I'm the one I'm like for a Filipino family like I'm the only male so like I'm the one that carries the name and there's like an added pressure for that as well and these are dynamics that like make no sense for many non Asians but if you speak with other Asians like oh yeah yeah I totally get it so like even if you're looking for mental health professionals to work with as an Asian American. Uh, sometimes you want to find someone that understands that, those dynamics because they're completely different from uh, uh, traditional American values. Wanted to uh, uh, work in the uh, the writing of Viet Thanh Nguyen, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, MacArthur Award Genius Grants winner, uh, professor of American studies at USC. Uh, and he wrote this this last summer uh, for the New York Times Sunday. Uh, on the one hand, Asian Americans have long insisted that we are patriotic and productive Americans, model minorities, right? This self-defense often leans on the model minority myth and the idea that Asian Americans have succeeded in fields such as medicine and technology because we immigrated with educational credentials and we raise our children to work hard. 1965 Immigration Act, right? High skilled. But Asian Americans are also haunting reminders of wars that killed millions of people and generated many refugees. And Asian Americans have come to satisfy the American need for cheap, exploitable labor, from working on railroads to giving pedicures. We are perceived to be competitors in a capitalist economy fractured by divisions of race, gender, and class, and the ever widening gap of inequality that affects all Americans. In other words, the model minority myth relies on disparities of historic American colonialism and late stage capitalism, 
our experience is very, very American. It's an incredibly American experience that is often written out of the way that we understand our identity as Americans. For example, uh, the anti-Chinese sentiment that pervaded California in the 1800s led to the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. It was fueled by fear over competition for jobs in the American West. It was renewed every 10 years into the 1900s. For Japanese Americans, there's an anti-Japanese sentiment in California through the 1920s, into the 1950s, all the way into the 1960s, uh, over owning uh, property in cities and towns around the state. This image, uh, Japs keep moving, this is a white man's neighborhood, was taken in 1923 in Hollywood, California, where we make movies today. Same kind of sentiment groups Filipinos. Uh, Filipinos were seen as uh, agricultural job competition. And this sign from 1945 reads, get rid of all Filipinos or we'll burn this town down. Uh, at the height of the Great Depression between the 1920s and the 1930s, uh, in one 18 month span, there were 37 different documented uh, events of anti-Filipino actions uh, and, and racism uh, throughout the American West and into places like Illinois and Wyoming as well. So anti-Asian sentiment is part of uh, this American story that we don't often acknowledge. And it's all come to head in the last year with Stop Asian Hate. Uh, but any student of history, and this is maybe because I'm showing my biases here as a historian, any student of history has seen this coming because Asians have always been a scapegoat for economic and class grievance in American history. In the last year and a half, you see things like this. Uh, it was just more pointed with terms like Kung Flu, the shootings in Atlanta that were characterized as targeting massage workers when the, uh, when the vast majority of the, of the victims were Asian American and uh, growing anti-Asian racism uh, that has been obvious and hiding in plain sight for a very long time. And that's because the Pew Research Council in, 19, in, in 2019 released this study uh, saying these things. 31% uh, of Asians reported that they had been the subject of slurs or jokes since COVID began in 2021. 26% of Asians fear someone might threaten or physically attack them at, since the start of COVID. And there's also this from 2019, from before COVID, even before the times of COVID, uh, Asian Americans report experiencing levels of discrimination at rates comparable to African Americans, 76% for Asian Americans and 76% for Blacks, right? It's been a tough last year and a half for all of us, but I know particularly in the springtime, uh, many of us were moved uh, to incredibly emotional uh, feelings because of being Asian American in COVID. And I wanted to give the students a chance to share some of those experiences themselves because the work they were doing in the spring uh, is incredibly inspiring. Um, sorry, I'm speaking so much. <laughs> um, so with the rise of COVID, um, fortunately for me, I personally did not experience any sort of like very hateful threats of any or discrimination. Um, but hearing about it made me really scared to go outside. And I know that sounds crazy, but like I work in retail, so I really have to be around a lot of different types of people. So going out, I was always worried like if people are looking at me weird because I, you know, I'm clearly Asian, I'm, like with the kind of atmosphere in society, like things spiraling out of control right now. I'm worried like if something were to happen to me, if something were to happen to my family members or my friends, like it's not unheard of for someone to go through a racial ex uh, discriminating experience, um, especially during this time. But for it to be happening so frequently and me hearing about all these violent acts, especially happening nearby, like in New York or in Boston or, and it could happen anywhere. and. I guess that really scared me. Um, but eventually people started realizing that, wow, like Asian hate is actually has been a thing. It's not just COVID. COVID heightened it and made it more obvious with more, you know, violent acts. But people were realizing that like this actually isn't anything too new. We have been experiencing racial discrimination for 
years, like as Dr. Akiza just showed, like literally since we got here, there has been a discrepancy between like us being people of color. Um, so seeing now with the stop Asian hate going on, it really makes feel, me feel like recognized and uplifted as like an Asian American that, wow, I'm for the first time in a very long time in my lifetime, at least, we're, we're actually being recognized for any sort of hateful, discriminating, or even like just something as passive, something as passive as the model minority myth. Um, those are all being recognized and being um, not advertised. I don't really know what the word would be, but more people are knowing about it outside of just my community. I can share my experiences with any of my friends because, you know, social media is growing and growing and showing everything and letting our voices actually be heard through everywhere, every outlet possible. So that, that was something that did come to light. And even though it is still a very unfortunate thing to talk about, um, I do appreciate that this is something I can openly speak about that everyone can actually know like, oh yeah, I did hear that on the news, even though I'm not personally an Asian American, I know that did happen. Um, can you hear me? Okay, so yeah, I mean, during the um the main phase of the pandemic, I was fortunate enough to not really experience anything direct or severe as some other people um in the media. Then again, I chose to opt um into staying on campus mostly or staying inside um during the summer twenty twenty um back when all the attacks were happening um at a, such a high rate, I stayed inside mostly um just, I guess, mostly for the fear of getting the the virus, not really thinking about the like racial implications of it. But then again, um, because of um, what Alicia referred to, um, the like increasing like awareness, documentation of these sort of attacks, um, I definitely felt for and feared for the lives of people who do um did choose to go outside, and those who did feel comfortable going outside, just because um. You know, being Asian, you can't really change that, and that sort of like place a target um on your back essentially. Um, even with the mask, you could sort of tell if someone's Asian. Um, and you know, you would see these videos online about people being attacked, um, like lit on fire, kicked in the face. A lot of elderly people too. Um, that's something to note. Um, because a lot of people who do these sort of attacks are <laughs> cowards um who prey on people who can't defend themselves um but yeah i mean i can't really speak for myself in terms of experiencing that sort of thing but definitely being able to see more um documentation and videos about like these sort of things re reading a bunch of articles highlighting the experience um which was not like non-existent before COVID. I mean, these sort of things happened way before the pandemic happened. But um, because of the whole pandemic and it being tied to a the Asian community, um, there's a lot more media coverage, like actual, like substantial media coverage and awareness. So it's sort of a double-edged sword because this thing is like, it's not like it's a new thing, but at the same time, it's good that there's awareness of it um it's just really heartbreaking to see um that a lot of people are suffering um more severely um not only like in terms of like the social sentiment but like being actually like having to fear for their lives and um you know the risk of being um, physically attacked maybe it's a comment on how wonderful our community is at providence but uh there was there was a there was an incident that happened in March uh, of uh, a, a Filipino American woman uh, being assaulted two blocks north of uh, uh, the, the the bus stations in New York City, and I remember Filipino American Twitter like uh, exploding into like basically a rideshare program, saying like and, and and organizing buddy systems if they were walking around Midtown Manhattan, then we we're going to walk together, and I didn't like I knew it was a big thing, and then I started watching the the news out of the Philippines. And the coverage in Manila was saying straight up, like, do you even want to go to the United States right now? Like, 
a, a Filipino American woman who was on her way to church, who was 47 years old, got assaulted while walking in the middle of Midtown Manhattan in the middle of the day, right? And I started getting cousins, uh, uh, text messages from my cousins uh, in Manila saying like, we're not sure we wanna send our kids to the United States for study abroad. Like one of my nephews just got accepted to, to, accepted to NYU for a master's program and they're deferring for a year because of all the things that have been going on to Asian Americans for the last year. Like it has actual repercussions outside of the Asian American community. It resonates in Asia, you know, like this stuff uh, has, has ramifications. Um, to bring the story even closer back home, take a look at how uh, did these Asian American movements play out in PC in the past. Uh, let's make the story local. How did it play out on our campus? Well, um, 1996, Professor of Ethnic Studies from Berkeley, Ron Takaki, uh, uh, was quoted in the cowl, and these are all from the cowl, uh, as saying this, uh, Dr. Takaki disclosed the disadvantage of being stereotyped Asian American because that is all people think of me as Asian American. I'm a surfer also, but people do not see that. Uh, Ronald Takagi did not know that four years later, I'd be sitting in his classroom as an undergraduate at UC Berkeley, uh, answering his questions about what is uh, the American frontier. Uh, straight back to the, the, the frontier thesis of Frederick Jackson Turner, it's where the civilization meets the savage. And at this point, the savage uh, in, in, the, in the 1840s, and, or when the frontier thesis was made in the 1870s, uh, was the white settling in California. Uh, you can make the, 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 uh, the same argument that uh, the frontier and the civilization meeting the savage hasn't really gone away because we're still facing the same kind of discrimination that, uh, that, we, are, that we are talking about historically in American history. 1999, uh, this is from the Cal Visions of Asia exhibit in 1999, showing textiles from around the continent of Asia to fight against the homogenizing of the Asian American that was now widespread. Uh, what we're trying to do is illuminate the differences between various Asian cultures. A lot of times people think that all Asian peoples wear the same thing, but each Asian country has its own look. So Asian Americans, just as Asian textiles reveal uh, that you can homogenize uh, any single Asian American identity. How are Asian American movements playing out of PC now? And this is where I kick it to uh, the students. Let's see, slide here. You all might need to share your slides uh, because I'm not sure that I can share them at this point. Uh, Tina, Alicia? Who's taking this? Oh no, it's, it's Aiden that's taking this one here. I think you can share that slide. Okay. Because it's in the, on the same PowerPoint. Okay. Here, I'll try and share. Uh, uh, Okay, you can, you can, okay, you can, uh, there we go. But um, so to start off, like in the past, we have like done like events like Lunar New Year's, one of our big festival with BOP. Um, the first like couple of pictures is from like two years ago. So it was like very like fun and, and interactive. But then because of COVID last year, we did like a food truck, and it, but it was still like nice because everybody still came. Uh, we have like makyeong sushi down here. That's like the chef come in and it's just like you can make your own sushi roll. But one of the big things that we did last semester, this uh, last spring, was um, the Stop Asian Hate um, discussion that we did with um, ourselves and some professors. And it was like really nice just because it was like new to all of us and we all had like a really good talk about it. And I was just like, but I thought like it was nice just because um, we're like, or at least to me, like I think Asians are more known as the silent minority. But when we started talking about all this and just like speaking up for ourselves, it was kind of like breaking that stereotype, and it was like a different like perspective for us, I guess. Um. So. We have a few different things coming up for the new semester. So we're actually thinking of having a sort of welcome back party, mostly geared towards um, student and faculty. That way, people who haven't really had a chance to go go to every Asian AM meeting can at least come to this little get together to get to know each other and just, you know, um, have a little fun, you know, at least have a friend or two 
to kind of occasionally talk about the club or see how the club is. Um, but it's more of like, uh, it's just a little cute, uh, like snacks and little party, like who doesn't like a party. And then we have the um, coordinating with faculties in uh, that way we can kind of expand on kind of the professors or faculty on campus because honestly throughout my almost three years here at campus I really have only gotten to know Dr. Akiza as our advisor but I really would like to get to know more faculty on campus and have more networking for not just myself but the members of the club as well that way like if something were to come up and someone were to ask me for some help I could have a reference for someone who can actually help with that situation. Um, so we're hoping to get closer and expand through our students and our faculty networking. And then as for our annual events, as Tina said, we're gonna try doing the events that um, made us really popular, like Maki Your Own Sushi, um, Lunar New Year, Imagination. Um, those are really fun activities that we look forward to setting up for everyone to enjoy. And then we also would like to do more co-sponsorships uh, co with other clubs. Um, on the side here, you can see our uh, posters with some co-sponsors that we've done in the past, and we're looking to do some more in the future. One of the things I wanted to, uh, to, co to collaborate with with the students here is to show that like historically, the only way that the Asian American movement has worked is by leading on the student activists and, and, uh, and working on the kind of organizing that that happens historically and continues today on our own campus. So I'm honored to be able to share uh, the stage today uh, with all of the PC executive board for Asian Am because they're continuing the work of uh, trying to define what is Asian American today and doing it in ways that are incredibly inspiring. I was talking with a, a friend of mine from college and I'm old now. And I was telling them uh, about what we we're doing today. And, uh, and she said, yeah, you know, like, there's so much more opportunity now that is available for defining Asian Americans and even bucking up against the Asian American model uh, minority stereotype that wasn't available just 20 years ago. Uh, and this is an example of what that looks like. So thank you, everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, now is the time. All right, we have an anonymous attendee question. Is there a reason why staff isn't included to participate in the upcoming events? Well, staff are absolutely uh, asked and encouraged to participate. Uh, it'd be kind of boring uh, to be just faculty members. Faculty are boring. Uh, it's a large community. <laughs> so there's a large number of us that are here and the more the merrier. If anything, uh, coming back to campus for all of us, regardless of, of race or ethnicity is going to be an exciting event. Having as many different kinds of people that could also be resources for this Asian American identity is only going to make coming back to campus even more empowering for everyone. So I, I don't think I'm speaking out of line, uh, uh, Tina or Alicia, by saying everyone's welcome. We have uh, another comment here. Uh, great job, especially thank you to the students for sharing your perspectives. I would not have the guts to have done this when I was in college. So honestly, thank you very much for, for volunteering to do this. Other comments? The Department of History classes would love to co-sponsor some of these events. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. And I am down with that as an historian. So I'm home, home represents. Uh, who should faculty contact if they're interested in supporting the student group? You can just email me. I can like leave my email down or <laughs> something. But yeah. Um... Yes, Tina is the best person to contact when it comes to these things. She's very organized. You will have the best emails written back to you. Just letting you guys know. I don't know about the best emails, but I'll get back to you. They're pretty good. Uh, uh, Susan McCarthy reminds me, uh, Professor Keys, I just want to remind you that you are a doctor. I, I will tell that to my parents. We'll see if they respond. <laughs> Uh, let's see, uh, thank you for a great presentation and sharing your experiences. Uh, just a quick plug for an upcoming library archives exhibit from Michelle Childs. Hi, Michelle. Uh, we're celebrating some student club anniversaries, including Asian Am, 30 years old, originally the Asian Cultural Club. 
Uh, my colleague will be reaching out to club leaders, right? Uh, I'll ask a question, <laughs> as is my right. Uh, what is the thing that you're most excited about uh, as executive board members for PCH and AM moving forward? What are you excited about for 2021-20? Um, I'm excited to meet more people because I, um, I feel like our club hasn't really been that big, maybe because we haven't advertised. Our, the only way we really, um, really push for our club is through events or um, actual scouting, which is also kind of hard to do. So having like a new method of contacting more people and getting to know other people, not just students, but also faculty and staff, um, I think that will be really exciting because I actually was hoping for this since the beginning, like my freshman year. And I'm glad that I'm able to participate in um, the growth of the club. I'm definitely excited for like a welcome back party and like the our coordination with the faculty just because I know during our last event or the, the Stop Asian Hate talk, a lot of the professors who showed up, they were like, I think some of them asked us like, oh, like we didn't know like this club existed. And I was like, oh, like I will, we would love to have, like just talk to you guys and just have you guys all involved in our events and everything. Cause we're pretty small on campus. So it's, it'll be nice for like even faculty and students to work together. I'm also looking forward to like our events. I mean, sometimes it gets a little stressful planning, but honestly, when it comes down to it, we, we like have a blast with that. Like I have the best time when I'm having, like hosting the events for our club. We have a comment from Dr. Colin Jondral, the history department, uh, and also the uh, uh, director of, the, of Asian studies. Uh, thanks to all of you, especially the exec board for presenting you today. Quick PSA, there's some great Asian American focused courses available this year. Dr. Chen Yi is in English is teaching an Asian American literature course this fall and I'll be teaching an Asian American history course in the spring. So we have a couple of uh, ways of building this into your curriculum uh, if you're a student. Uh, and there's done. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. Do you have any suggestions regarding expanding enrollment of Asian American study students at PC? Oh, I actually have a really good answer for this one. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was around la the end of last semester, we discussed kind of like different things we could do as a club. Um, so one of the ideas I came up with was kind of like, not like, I guess it would be similar to an outreach team because I am on the, um, I'm on the Cunningham scholarship, which I didn't really know about until my cousins told me about the, um, what is it called? Multicultural scholarship here. And unlike the um, Martin Luther King Jr. scholarship that they have at PC, the Cunningham scholarship covers the same things, except it's geared towards Southeast um, Asian students. So I think having us maybe like reach out to schools nearby in Providence or in Rhode Island or whatnot, um, we do have connections to different schools. I think it would be really cool to kind of reach out to those schools, reach out to those students and just let them know like, you know, PC, we're here, you know, we're, we have a good um, community growing here. We have the scholarship that people can apply for. That would be a really great way for further enrollment, more people applying for PC. So um, I think definitely focusing on reaching out to local schools and focusing on the Cunningham scholarship would be really good for enrollment. Any other questions? Oh, Anne, and Manchester Mullick. Thanks so much for sharing so much great info. John Chen, a prominent alum we honored at commencement would be happy and honored to help the club discuss ways to engage, et cetera. There we go. Now there's a Friar network amongst Asian M's as well. Uh, Professor Chambers, it's all yours. Oh, there's another question. One more, sorry, 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 Chris, one more. Uh, does the Asian AM club ever hold events involving alumni? There are some really talented and distinguished alumni in the area, a great way to build the community and network. All right, I guess we've got a, an action item now. 
I thought before we closed out today, I'd, I'd give um, Dr. Akiza or any of our student panelists an opportunity to share any final thoughts, any things you want to make sure that you leave the audience uh, with. Uh, oh, we've got a raised hand from Dr. Uh, Dr. Ye or Jen Ye. Um, I don't know. Oh, uh, she says, thanks for the input. <laughs> but uh, any final thoughts before we, we finish up today? Anything that anybody want to leave us with before we're done? Um, I think you also mentioned something in the group chat talking about the model minority myth. I did. Um, I can definitely expand on that. Like in terms of the education system and the model minority myth itself, going into school, people have these expectations like, oh, you're Asian. You have to be really smart. You must be really good at math, which can be true or cannot be true as with any other student. But I feel like you have other classmates that apply that type of stereotype and pressure onto you to be a very smart student. And then when you end up maybe not having meeting those expectations, they're like, oh, so you're like the dumb Asian. Like, it's not even just, it's not even average. You're either the smart Asian or the dumb Asian. I'm like, oh, okay. That kind of makes me feel terrible. But um, so it's, I guess that's how the model minority myth really plays into the actual education system. Luckily, I don't get much of that at college anymore, but in high school, that was really like, really prevalent in my life. So it was pretty tough. Well, thanks for sharing that. Any other final thoughts or comments for anyone? More just an observation that uh, when I was uh, a student, uh, this kind of activism was just like in, in the water. You know, this is like part of being an Asian American and it's really inspiring now that I'm not a student to see students that are even more fervent in, mm. in that belief than I was. So I'm inspired and uh, in, invigorated working with everyone on this call. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they helped me re remember why I became an educator. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Dr. Akiza, I want to thank you so much for uh, participating in the panel today and, and leading us in this really vibrant discussion. Uh, as well, I want to say thanks to Josh, to Aiden, Tina, and Alicia for uh, sharing bravely your stories and your experiences and sort of your hopes for the future. I believe you've given us all a great deal to think about and a lot to inspire us. Uh, I want to thank all of you for participating today. Uh, we hope to see you uh, again in, I believe, next week we have another uh, talk coming up so uh, look be on the lookout for that information and we hope to see you next week as well so take care everyone have a good rest of the day thanks for listening to this presentation as part of the summer series on racial equity and justice on the providence college podcast remember for recordings of past webinars and to register for future talks go to institutionaldiversity.providence.edu. Podcast episodes are available in all the usual places, as well as the college's YouTube channel and through your smart speaker. With producer Chris Judge, I'm Liz Kay. Until next time.